Eh, what's up, Doc? Eric Bowser here, the voice behind some of your favorite classic cartoon characters. And if you're gonna geek out... Geek hard. That's all, folks. Please welcome a very talented voice actor. You've heard him do tons of your favorite voices, and also he's quite the entrepreneur, Mr. Eric Bowser. Hey, well, insert audience noise here. Thank you guys for having me. Uh, I really do appreciate uh, your time uh, uh, talking to me today. And we appreciate yours, man. Uh, We've gotten to check out a couple of the episodes of Stay Tuned, which, of course, is launching on CBC Gem on October 2nd, sorry, December 2nd. Um, on December 2nd, 2023. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you have a flux capacitor attached to your television, we will not be able to watch this back in time. Yeah. Yeah. No. So December 2nd, 2022. Um, of course the show, uh, when I watched the first couple episodes, got really excited about it. Cause it's the t- type of show that I really enjoy where deep diving and dissections for people who haven't had a chance to hear about it yet. What's it all about? Uh, it is not just a nostalgia show, although it's, uh, it's kind of hard to avoid, uh, especially when we are examining cartoons of our past. Uh, but, but it is a, uh, like you said, a deep dive into uh, maybe some subjects that uh, may, may have been in our faces the entire time watching it as kids or buried uh, deep within uh, maybe something a little bit more subliminal. Uh, and we're talking about subjects like uh, racism, consumerism, capitalism, uh, moral messaging and moral panic in cartoons, uh, inclusion uh, with uh, LGBTQ+, plus, as well as uh, uh, sexism and, uh, you know, uh, all, all that stuff that you wouldn't think uh, could be associated with your kid-friendly Saturday morning cartoons, but of course... Uh, may have may have been there the entire time yeah it, you know it's uh, it's great that i love this idea because you're you're so right because as i as i was watching them as a child in the 80s you don't really think too much about it because you're a child right it's right. not top of mind going back and re-watching some of these you know these classic shows and you you start to see some of the things that you guys talk about in the episodes where it's like all of a sudden and then as an adult and you've learned more things you realize like oh maybe things weren't quite as, you know, <laughs> kid friendly as we all thought they were. Right. It's like my next show is going to be about what's in a Big Mac and I'm going to ruin that for you too. <laughs> You're going to be like, damn it. I just want to enjoy a Big Mac. I don't want to know what's in it. I don't want to, uh, I don't want to Mo- know what's Morgan Spurlock beat you to that years ago. Yeah, You're, yeah, covered. Exactly, You're covered. Exactly, there you go. Exactly. Exactly. Oh my God. All, gosh, all I got to say though is Eric is if you ever try to ruin today's special, <laughs> we're gonna have we're gonna yeah, that's right that's why i know i thought i saw jeff's hat and i was yeah. like oh man is that what i think it is <laughs> yeah this is a retro kid original uh, uh tvo officially sponsored and sanctioned uh t-shirt uh yeah i mean we'll we'll, we'll cover that too uh, uh retro kid but uh but definitely yeah uh, it, it is it is a, a, a peer uh, behind the curtain of the cartoons of our youth but also again like a look forward to to how cartoons are being done now and and what is being done uh, by the storytellers and and the people producing these shows uh, to kind of learn from our past, uh, the the problematic past, if there was one. Yeah, what was it that inspired you to go, hey, I really wanna make this show? Well, it's funny because I was approached by this amazing group of uh, producers over at Fathom Film Group, and they're a Toronto-based company. Uh, Mainly, uh, they've produced a lot of uh, award-nominated and award-winning documentaries, Um, but they really wanted to make a show about cartoons. And uh, somehow, I guess they stumbled upon me being from Toronto and... um, I guess voicing one of the biggest mega stars in animation, of course, Daffy Duck. Uh, somehow they're like, maybe this this could be a, 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 the right person to host the show. And all I could think of was, you know what? Uh, I'm going to do this one episode just so I could say I did something with my life and, and no one's ever going to pick it up. You know, uh, that's how much I, the self-deprecating Canadian in me uh, w- was thinking like, no, no, they'll watch it and go, that, that's nice. And then they'll pass. But then, of course, CBC was like, well, order six. And I'm like, crap, now I got to work. <laughs> Now I actually have to work. I got to, you know, learn and brush up on these subjects. And um, no, it was it was a great experience getting to work with the Fathom Film Group. They are 
without a doubt with their you know writing staff and and i was included in brainstorm and shape every episode um you know i i can only hope that we get another season uh and and also i was just shocked to to learn that each episode's only 22 minutes the the amount of information we jam pack into 22 minutes versus the 44 minute format is insane and also with three guests is is kind of crazy to think that we covered as much as we could thank god for youtube channels and instagram where um uh, maybe uh you will find the extended versions of those interviews or any any person that didn't make the cut for an episode you will find their extended interview on our social media platforms for sure so keep an eye out for that that's awesome because I, I had no I have no doubt that it was tough decision making at some points to keep it to that 22 minutes, right? Like, yeah, you know, like that's one of the classic problems with a lot of animation is that, you know, it, when you sit to that 22 minutes trying to fit everything in, sometimes it doesn't work and you have to leave some jokes on the floor. Right. And again, you know, and if we're going to talk about, uh, you know, censorship and, and content and how things get made, sometimes those regulations and those constraints often push you to make better and creative decisions. So, you know, in a sense, it probably helped us. Um, you know, I, I remember sitting with some of these folks for over an hour sometimes, like just talking and just chatting and, uh, you know, j j even if it's just like life experience stuff that you want people to hear, uh, like how uh, we got a, a friend of mine, Candy Milo, in uh, just to talk about cartoons in general so we can get some like, you know, just some, some B-roll stuff from like, quick quick uh, uh uh rapid fire uh interviews but we we ended up talking about like her audition like on tiny tunes and how spielberg picked her and you know like all this like interesting stuff that I, as a kid i never i grew up watching half of the people that i work with and uh to, to think that i got to work with them uh in the last 15 to 20 years and then on this show get to interview them for a show that i have on cbc this this whole year this you know I'll, 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 the last three years have definitely been a fever dream for everyone on planet earth um you know with with the pandemic and all uh driving down the 101 freeway in a, in a red dodge challenger like glenn from the walking dead uh, was definitely <laughs> something that i did Looking for toilet paper, of course, but uh, I never thought it would result in the last three, four years would would end up a, a, with a TV show on CBC Gem about cartoons, something that I absolutely love. Well, yeah, you, it's you, crazy. And you've got like a murderer's row of voice mm -hmm. actors featured in this all the way up and down the card. You know, of course, uh, you got Chris Summer in there. Mm -hmm. You got Tara Strong. You got a bunch of great ones, but of course, I'd have to say there's probably one interview that you did during it that now is more, mm. even more extra special. She did about a year ago with Mr. Kevin Conroy. Kevin Conroy. I knew you were going to, you had to bring it up because I mean, he's the man, the Batman of the hour. And um, he was always so gracious with his time with me and uh, always so kind. Uh, I, I would so like, I mean, between him and Mark Hamill, like, I, how could you not fanboy out, you know, being in a room with these guys, these titans, these uh, basically the Mount Rushmore of of, uh, of cartoon voice actors. And I remember working with Kevin, Mr. Conroy, uh, on a uh, Mattel was was uh, repurposing old footage from Batman, the animated series uh to do a new virtual reality experience a vr it came with like a batman vr thing and you would pop in the you know the 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 game into your console and it would basically force you to go around gotham city you would use the batmobile you use the batwing but then you would end up like at arkham asylum and then you would be you would see a scene of like from batman the animated series but we would redub and we would have to lip sync over old footage and one of the characters that i voiced uh was the paul williams originated character of the penguin and all the the blundering you know the bats in the belfry having to talk like that and just knowing that i was you know trying to approximate that impression number one is like insane enough but then you're in a room with kevin conroy and he's talking to you as batman and i'm like oh my god what 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 did I do to win this lottery? You know, like yeah. this is uh, insane. Uh, but yeah, he he was, uh, this was about a year ago at LA Comic-Con. We're actually coming up to LA Comic-Con the first week of December, uh, formerly known as Kamikaze, Stan Lee's uh, comic convention. And um, 
And I remember seeing him and Tom Kenny. Tom Kenny was supposed to be another person that I interviewed, but he was like, hey, Bowser, I'm sorry. I can't do it. I can't do it. Look at this lineup. You know, everyone was there for Bikini Bottom. And the lineup was just as fierce for Batman. But Kevin was like, oh, no, no, don't worry. Just give me a minute. I'll, uh, you know, I, I will I will put my fans on pause for you for like 15 minutes. And we literally did the interview like in <laughs> it was like close to the kitchen of like like the the comic convention. If you look at that footage, we're just like in a hallway in like the most unluxurious spot in the convention. But you would be surprised. And as you guys probably know, covering press uh, at some conventions, that is like the best way to avoid the crowd is to go through the guts yeah. of the yeah. building, right? Uh, have you guys ever done the San Diego Comic-Con before? Unfortunately not. We've only really covered events in Toronto. Guys, so if you want tickets, I'm your guy. Let me know. I will get oh. you passes, and you guys can come, and uh, you guys could do your show from, from San Diego next year. Um, That'll be awesome. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll send you an email later. Definitely. You have it You have it on tape now. Now I have to go. I, I'm going to live up to this promise. <laughs> you will definitely get passes to go to San Diego. I got your back. I got your back. Yeah, but, this, is the, this is the part of the show we're not cutting out. Uh, we're yeah. not <laughs> Yeah, not counting it out. No. In fact, we're starting awkwardly right at the beginning. Yeah. Of this. <laughs> and then we'll jump into the promotional stuff later. Right. You heard it here first, folks. Bugs Bunny promises San Diego Comic-Con passes. Uh, I will I will get you passes if you guys want for next year. But uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of incredible how amazing uh, Kevin uh, was, uh, not just as a performer, but as a, as a colleague and as a friend. And I think I, I speak for everyone listening and, and, and especially your, your, your gentlemen selves that we will miss him very, very, very much. Oh yeah. A hundred percent. I, I only got to meet him one time, but it was like your like yourself. It was, I fanboyed out quite a bit, yeah. and, but he was so cool and gracious and, you know, uh, still managed to make the, uh, the, the interview work with, you know, cause he's, he is a professional, whereas I just, fell on my sword in front of him uh <laughs> but no it, it, it was it a was to be day. to it was a hot room it was a very warm yeah. room, so. <laughs> you fell on your batarang yeah yeah it was uh but no I, it, it, but to your point he was such a, a a great uh like for that short period of time i got to talk to him, he's such a great human being and uh, when I heard the news, it, yeah, it, it, it hurt. Uh, it was a shocker. And, you know, much like someone like Norm Macdonald, like kept that to themselves and didn't yeah. want to burden anyone with, with their problems or, or their ailments or whatever it is they, they were going through. And that just kind of shows you what, you know, um, what kind of person they are. And, uh, and again, they will always be remembered for the joy they brought uh, to the masses Again, I I wrote every day after school. I would come home and hear that voice. You know, yeah. that was the the voice. That was Batman. That as soon as that Warner Brothers logo turned dark, and then uh, we are in Gotham, and suddenly we're seeing criminals getting punched out. You know, that was what that was the jump from Tiny Toons and Animaniacs to okay, let's get our film noir in, and then uh, and then we'll call it a day. Now I got to do my homework. Yeah. Um, but that was it. You know, Warner Brothers after school was was the block for me. Yeah, I know for sure. And, and, you know, and to your point, like, it, it, like this talk of, of Kevin and, and his impact and like hearing not only yourself, but we've heard for over since his passing, the number of people talking about him, uh, both colleagues, but also the fans and, you know, yourself working in the industry, like, you know, now for, you know, a, a few, a few years, you know, you've, uh, you've, and you've, uh, you've gained your, your also your little cadre of, uh, of fans <laughs> that uh, love your work. Has it sunk into you how much your like your career impacts other people? Like the show talks about a lot about this as well, but like the characters you were voicing, which you know, for some people, quote unquote, is work, um, becomes this doorway to people who just feel like they know you, even though it's not your face. You know, they just hear right. a version of your voice. Well, I think now with even this television show, that might that that'll definitely change things. I won't be able to go and uh, you know buy a bag of apples at the local metro uh, grocery store now. <laughs> I've I've lost that uh, you know veil of secrecy, that an anonymity, and uh, I, it's fine. I love talking to the 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 people that I'm catering to, you know, talking to mm -hmm. the fans, and I'm sure you guys feel the same way when when you meet people that listen to your show. 
And, you know, that's what you make. That's why you're doing this, right? You're kind of doing this, not just for yourselves, for the pure joy of it, but to entertain people and kind of like build that community. And that kind of comes hand in hand when you're you're making cartoons, no matter how secretive that lifestyle you've, you've chosen. It's not the on camera world, but like you're still putting something out there for people to listen to and enjoy. And um, when anyone comes up to me and says, recognizes me or spots me out, it happened at CN Tower last night. I was just literally trying to take my son to the aquarium and they closed early for a private event. And for the first time in three years, I was able to kind of just walk up to CN Tower and get a ticket. I used to work there. I worked there from uh, 96 to 98. I was the elevator guy. And then I ended up at the Motion Simulator Theater down by Qzar, the, uh, the, by, by their laser tag maze. They used to have laser tag down there. It's also where I met Kurt Russell and his kids for the first time. Oh, wow. Uh, before, I, before I had that radio appearance with him. But, um, yeah, yeah. Uh, it, it, it was funny. One of the guys that worked there was like, are you, you, you do the voice of Bugs Bunny, right? And I'm like, yeah. And he kind of like, and he was an employee at the tower. He's like, I'm so sorry how unprofessional I did. You know, I don't want to disturb you and your, and your kid is, ah, I don't, I don't care. This is great. You know, like you, good for you. You, you, you recognize me. Your prize is a, a selfie. And he asked me for a, a picture and, and we did, I did a voice for him and, and the rest of the staff. And, uh, you know, I used to work like the I used to take drunk people down from the CN Tower at New Year's Eve. That was like the worst shift was New Year's Eve in an elevator looking looking at Toronto from uh, from my little glass uh, window. Um, I remember taking Joan Rivers uh, up the late great Joan Rivers. She was the last but you could jam about 15 people into that elevator before the doors close. Hmm. And she goes, OK, I'm afraid of heights. Don't say anything stupid. That's what she said to me. And I went, uh, I said, no problem, ma'am. Um, hey, welcome to the CN Tower. We're traveling up at a speed of 22 kilometers per hour. That's 15 miles per hour for the Americans in the uh, elevator. Uh, if you all uh, look to your left, you'll all see the Sky Dome, which is the home of the Toronto Blue Jays. And if you all look to the right, the elevator will tip over. Uh, and um, <laughs> at like, like, you know, like when you, if you have ever, ever, ever thrown a cat at someone, their claws come out. And uh, and they claw right into your arms and legs. That's what happened. Joan, Joan Rivers, like clawed right into my arm, and like for thirty seconds, like her nail, like you could see blood, like like her nails were piercing skin. And uh, when we were done, like I was letting people off, she goes, "Eric, you're a horrible little boy." That's what she said. <laughs> you're a horrible little boy. I was like, I'm so sorry, Joan Rivers. I will never, I will never uh, 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 test your your fears and in, in afraid of heights uh, in an elevator again. But she was she was so funny and so nice. But um, but yeah, uh, secrecy's out the window, and uh, and I don't mind if I'm helping uh, inform people uh, of cartoons with this TV show. Uh, then I completely uh, do not mind that. Of course not. Definitely not. Um... But of course, you know, again, we talked about you voiceovers for cartoons, but uh, as the mediums grow, you've gotten to branch out into other different patterns. And uh, this was it this past week, just before Thanksgiving was released, the uh, Daffy <laughs> Duck and uh, Bugs Bunny Thanksgiving oh. Road Trip podcast. Yes. Yeah. The funny thing is that that's been like uh, up for about a year now. We did it last year. We didn't have any media coverage. It kind of just kind of came and went. And uh, it's still up on HBO Max. And I did it with uh, Story Pirates. They they produce, um, you know, long play, uh, you know, podcast slash radio plays um, uh, with uh, well-known intellectual property. And Looney Tunes just happened to be on their docket to produce a story of how Daffy Duck unknowingly wants to become the Thanksgiving bird. He doesn't know... <laughs> I don't know why I'm not the center of attention on Thanksgiving and why the turkey is a mascot, but it should be me, me, me. So, um, uh, sure, Dave, uh, no problem. We can make that happen for you if you, if you really want. You know, Bugs knows that the turkey yeah. gets eaten, but, um, but Daffy does not, and he tries everything in his power to change uh, the course of tradition and become the Thanksgiving, the official Thanksgiving bird. <laughs> well, there you go. My God. Um, now, um, was it, uh, aside from being a voice actor and we've kind of touched on this already, you are an entrepreneur. You are yes. one of the founders <laughs> of retro kid. That's correct. Uh, 
the the fine merchandise that it is with uh, some of <laughs> uh, you talked before about nostalgia this really taps into nostalgia oh absolutely not just any specific kind of nostalgia but uh canadian nostalgia if we're yeah. gonna get finite about it um uh, my old uh, high school best buddy Steve Gaskin and I were always uh, we always had a competition between our, ourselves and our group of friends of of who could walk into a room with the best graphic t-shirt and I I I was of the era that where, where you wore a cartoon shirt you're a bit of a nerd people would be like ah why why are you wearing a a who shot Mr. Burns t-shirt how weird uh, you know, I used to get all of my cartoon shirts from the It store, if you guys remember it's that store, yeah. yep. it's store. Uh, and that was at Fairview Mall. They had one at uh, Scarborough Town Center. They had one at Eaton Center, I think. And even they had one e out in Oshawa Center, too. Oshawa Center, too? Yeah, yeah. Sweet. They and Pickering. They were everywhere. Town Center. Yeah. Uh, I know in, in downtown uh, Toronto, specifically at the Eaton Center, they also had a joke store called Mr. Green Jeans that was attached to the Mr. Green Jeans restaurant, but uh, I might be yeah. dating myself there. But um, I ate at the restaurant, didn't know about the joke shop. That's where I got my fart spray and fake dog poo from when I was running low on supplies, uh, <laughs> you know, as a as a child prankster uh, from the 90s, uh, taking my cues from Kevin McAllister and uh, the kid from Problem Child. But um, yeah, I uh, I used to get all my cartoon shirts from the It store and they, they kind of came and went. And uh, I mean, there would be some places like uh the uh what was the name of that one on queen street i think it might still be there black market i'm not sure but black market uh, clothing is still yeah. there yeah is it still there yeah they you know I, I remember getting a random cbc shirt from them it could have been bootleg it could have been official but i don't think anyone has ever celebrated canadian nostalgia the way retro kid has and kind of and has done it like in a fully licensed like all of the things that we put out there for them you know like at least for like CBC, TVO, um, uh, Nelvana and Chorus, like YTV, we're actually approaching the companies that own the licenses for these for merchandise. And they're they're doing it. They're doing a pretty good job. But I, I don't think anyone outside of their own uh, their own companies have collectively gotten been able to do like a CBC and a TVO collection within the same week uh, and kind of uh, do it the right way. Like this was actually uh this was one from our very first round we had one round with tvo already uh, but they left it up to the fans and it was more of a public funded thing and and because it is tvo publicly publicly funded company uh, they 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 weren't really open to doing a full merchandise line and for whatever reason this round they're like let's just let's just make legit like a legit collection for the fans like let's do an actual like proper collection so this was actually a frame grab from YouTube that I got digitally cleaned up because if you obviously know, like anything from the seventies and eighties was not digital. It no. was all, someone probably has the animation cells from this somewhere in their closet. Mm -hmm. Like I want one and I want to get it framed badly. Um, but uh, what I had to do was get a frame grab from like the highest resolution of the, the show intro. Uh, you need to get it cleaned up uh, in illustrator to make it vector. And then you could get that printed onto any garment, like, and it'll look yeah. legit. So this is like a, uh, probably a four to five color screen print. And this will, you could wash this as many times as you want and it's not going to fade. It's not going to crack. Uh, this is like super high quality. Also, everything we do is made in Toronto. So, um, you know, there's, there's no overseas uh, production uh, thus far, uh, although I guess if we actually do want to start uh, <laughs> turning a profit, we might have to in today's climate. It's kind of tough these days to, mm -hmm. uh, to to be in any kind of business. So we're learning that the hard way. But uh, thank God for the fans and thank God for Canadian support. Um, it's it's something funny that I think there's something funny about Canadians, Canadian children's programming that is just so weird and <laughs> like was also nightmare fuel for some people uh like hilarious house of frightenstein if you were oh, yeah. if you were young enough to remember that we oh, did yeah. a collection with those guys mitch markowitz the one uh, he was super hippie and he was like one of the last founding members of the original group that made that show in the 60s and i was surprised to learn that things like you can't do that on television degrassi today's special mr dress up did get to the united states via nickelodeon mm -hmm. and also pbs 
So our weird, wacky Canadian kids programming did make it to the U.S. There are some people that have purchased our stuff in the last two years uh, south of the border, which is also nice. Oh, yeah, yeah totally. It, it always makes me laugh when I hear Americans talk about some of these shows. Yeah. Because the way they talk about it is as if everyone around them thinks they're insane and that these shows <laughs> never yeah. existed, right? Because when you start, like to your point, when you start explaining something like The Raccoons or Today's yeah. Special or yeah. any of the other infinite number of things that we have, like how, Hilarious House of Frankenstein, you start to try to explain these concepts to people. And they they think that you've done like a ridiculous amount of acid because it, <laughs> because it doesn't well, make any sense. I'm sure sense. that's that, that's how these shows were made uh, <laughs> under <laughs> under a ridiculous amount of acid. Ridiculous amount of acid uh, definitely. But yeah, you have to understand that when the person leaves, they put on the pokeroo costume and our pokeroo, right? right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. They're like, yeah, sure, buddy. Uh, yeah. That indica or sativa you're smoking when. Uh, when you watch yeah. this yeah. yeah or here's this magic hat that turns a plastic mannequin <laughs> into a real live person but only at night yeah who talks like, to no 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 uh casey was the puppet that could talk but couldn't move his mouth finnegan was the puppet <laughs> yeah. that could move his <laughs> mouth but couldn't talk, could talk. Yeah. Yeah. yeah well he could talk he just chose not he chose to whisper yes he whispered into <laughs> yeah into yeah. casey's ear yeah oh my god so good yeah, no, great stuff. I actually, uh, looking at the the merch you got coming on uh, December 1st, uh, really liking that Beachcomber stuff. That looks pretty good. Oh, yeah. Like, we we had the Beachcombers uh, uh, toque before, and now we're like, nice. we got to do a shirt. Because we did a Danger Bay shirt that did really well. Uh, you know, uh, again, another one of these just so bizarre. I, I'm, uh, I have a few ideas for uh, The Littlest Hobo, which was that German Shepherd that... Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, I, I got some good shirt ideas for that. Um, but, you know, again, uh, there's just so much stuff that, like, we, we have yet to even scratch the surface of uh, that uh, that I, you know, that I that I want to bring uh, bring to the Canadian masses. So... You, you know, have you... a Camp Caribou. Oh yes. my God, Camp Caribou! Oh. Caribou was a was a huge one, and we got the blessing from the original campers uh, on that. And um, yeah, I, I, again, it's it's just an honor to I I, I want to do Sharon Lois and Bram. You know, I want to do the Elephant Show. I want to yeah. do. Uh, gosh, there's just there's still so much stuff on YTV. Some pretty obscure stuff i want to do the, the toothbrush family if we have oh, access to that my God, yeah. like, yeah, i would love to uh <laughs> produce i'd love to produce toothbrush family action figures uh that would be cool how, how bizarre would that be it's like here's a family of inanimate uh you know uh toiletries <laughs> here's, a, here's, a, here's a brush here's a bar of soap with eyes on it um yeah i don't know there, there's just something about uh you know, we could do Smoggies. That's another one. Oh, uh, yeah, Smoggies, you know, yeah. The, uh, again, we did Inspector Gadget. That was a huge Canadian co-production. Uh, Police Academy, the animated series, was another. Uh, I want an animated Tackleberry shirt from Police Academy. <laughs> Who? Me? Just me? Okay, fine. Uh, maybe just Ooh. me. Maybe I'll just make a one-off just for me. But, um, yeah, there's just so much stuff out there. Beetlejuice was another uh, Canadian co-production that was... Yeah. I think arguably one of the most popular Saturday morning kids cartoons because it ran on Fox and I think ABC at the same time. Mm. Like it ran on two competing networks at the same time. And it's like a morbid show about death, you know, like it's about a guy in the afterlife, some creep named Beetlejuice, uh, you yeah. know, it, yeah, it no, was a groundbreaking crazy. show. Definitely. Now, as you can tell by the way that myself and Mr. Green popped through most of those shows that you mentioned, <laughs> That we're all children of the 80s. Of course, of course. Uh, of course, definitely. And uh, there's one particular episode for Stay Tuned that I'm actually excited to see. I haven't had a chance to see it yet, of course. We'll be seeing it once it drops. Is the After These Messages, messages episode where you guys kind of delve into the cartoons selling toys oh, and items. Yeah. And how, well, kind of the 80s kind of kicked that off as like the major boon moment. I mean, I feel like, again, it's it's one of those political plays of whoever's in office kind of was like, well, I guess that would be uh, Ronald Reagan. Yeah. Uh, uh, why don't we just let the toy companies uh, have at it? You know, like, think about that. Think about, like, if you're a toy company and suddenly you're given the permission to be like uh, making a 22 minute long toy commercial. Sure. Thanks. You know, get away with murder. Thanks. 
And guess what? I mean, it trickles down after year after year. You're talking to a guy that owns a nostalgia company. So not only am I, I'm like double-edged sorting it here. Like I am part of the, the problem uh, <laughs> by, by ushering, you know, and pushing these products and, and kind of that feeling to, to people when we needed it the most. In the last three years, you know what? Mm. If all we had was our nostalgia to, to get us through the day, then that was fine, you know? Uh, but if my son has to miss the first year of college because of my my bad habits of buying uh, reissued Optimus Prime toys, uh, <laughs> the same ones that I still own, like the die cast metal inside the uh, in my toy chest over here, uh, and then, oh, God damn Hasbro, they re-released the exact same packaging from like, do you remember like those the, the Transformers yeah. box that has oh like, yeah the, with the remember, window the, the chart yeah. the chart on the back where yeah. you put yeah. that yeah. red film over it um it's crazy and then on top of that i did the voice of uh drift uh you know hold on one sec um <laughs> it's like i can't i can't win you know i can't win because if they reissue these toys there's probably a good chance that i've probably voiced them and if I voice them, there's probably a good chance that I'm going to buy them. And if they, if I don't buy it, I'm going to eat at McDonald's and then there I am as a Happy Meal toy. So I'm screwed. I'm so oh screwed. God. And not only am I I'm so screwed that I made a show to tell you how screwed I am uh, when it comes to my finances. Uh, yeah, like, generally, hey, those companies are making their money back from you. You do a job for them and then they get all the money back with what you buy. Like, this moron keeps buying the stuff that he's in. Uh, he hasn't yes. learned that these will be around when he's buried in the dirt. Uh, but you know what? I, I love it. I'm a collector. I'm a fan. Uh, I see uh, some toys in the background of, of both your uh, setups. So I know I'm not alone. But yeah, the consumerism episode is actually a really good one. And again, I am I am the cat eating its tail in this scenario where I am so screwed like forever and ever and ever because you know uh, these characters keep coming back and um that's another thing i was talking about too in some interviews was that it seems to be that kids programming or kids animation is like it's reboot central like mm -hmm. there's no way to escape it however adult animation like adult swim or like teletoon after dark or whatever you want to call it is probably the only place where you can get original animated content. Like they want like the next Rick and Morty. They want the next, you know, thought provoking adult cartoon that is not based off of any toy line and uh, does well. It'll still generate merchandise if it's popular, you know, like yeah. I have yet to see a big mouth backpack, but I've seen lots of Rick and Morty stuff. Uh, but like, yeah, it seems to be like kids cartoons is, you know, uh, intellectual property city and then anything 18 and up for cartoons is like we welcome real stories and you know real character driven stuff so it's just interesting to see where where it has all landed and where it all ends up oh yeah it's your point right like uh, he-man's come back it well, actually in multiple incarnations but yeah sometimes we saw she rock come back it came back twice in the same year right yeah. like the like kevin it, smith version and then like another version I was yeah like, and they're both with, still going too with it, like within, they both within, have, wow. they both have orders months. for more yeah within wow. within it was within i remember because the kevin smith version dropped and i watched it of course and i watched it and then it was like i think it was another old, version came out yeah it, it was and, about a kid right a kid yeah, it, finding the yeah it's it's a younger adam it's and they they play with it you know it's a different animation style yeah and and but that was only like maybe four weeks after the end of of smith's version or something like that it was very very quick and i was this like this is where we are this is where we are and i, I learned it being uh, uh like tiger claw on the 2012 version of ninja turtles and then splinter on the same version of rise where they literally they announced and again it's just so funny how the public is and the audiences these days because i remember when the cg reboot the 2012 ninja turtles came out and people freaked out when they're like you gave the turtles three toes, you know, instead of just two, like, how dare you? And then like, when they announced that they ca they're canceling it after five years, people were like, don't cancel my Ninja Turtles. Now, <laughs> now suddenly they're Ninja Turtles. But I remember like, I was like, oh damn. Um, 
they announced they're like we're so sorry we're, we're canceling the 2012 turtles but don't worry we're gonna give you this new version called rise and then people like already hated it immediately because they're like <laughs> how dare you give us something new that we we just got used to this after five years and you're gonna give us this new thing so i feel like rise got a, a bum bum rap right at the beginning uh but again now it it has had time to breathe they dropped this amazing movie on netflix and people are like so any chance we can get a third season of rise you know like yeah. But now it's like, uh, you know, uh, Seth Rogen's uh, TMNT. <laughs> uh, I think they should all talk like Michelangelo. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know what he has in store for us. I don't know what he has in store for us, but uh, I'm sure it's going to be great. Well, you know, it's amazing what you just talked about because it's so utterly true. Especially, all fandoms, but I, I've noticed it, you know, obviously in, in animation is the... Uh, I how dare you remake this thing? It was perfect the way it was. Then they remake it. Then they watch it. And they're like, uh, they, they hate watch for a while. And then it's <laughs> like, to your point, it becomes their favorite thing in the universe they when love, you cancel yeah. it. And then it, and then the new thing comes out and then it's just rinse and repeat again. It's like, yeah. it, it's a crazy concept. It's like, they have to do that mainly to create new toys. Right. I mean, at yeah, the end of the day, sure. especially with something like Ninja, Ninja Turtles, yeah. you kind of have to do it. But I, I was just here, like last week, I was here um, for the Toronto Animation Festival, and the very last panel for Taffy was a Rise of the TMNT panel, and the fans came out, and there were people crying, like, because we showed extended clips and versions of things that they had seen already in, in the movie on Netflix and, and from the show, and it was just touching. It was so nice, and I kind of dubbed the panel as the rap party, because we never you know, the end of the show happened during COVID and we never really got to celebrate the end of the show. So I said, hey guys, this is, to me, this is the official end, like the rap party. Thank you for being here. You guys are part of it. And it was really cool to see and and to see, like, I almost cried watching people like get teared up, you know, uh, uh, watching these clips and, and how how these characters and these cartoons stay with people and move them. And probably do more for them than than we as the the creators know and more than we'll ever know uh it's only times like this where i get to connect with other people that appreciate it or the fans like at comic-con where we really get a gist of how impactful these cartoons are uh once once we've put them in the can and ship them off to the distributor yeah definitely well yeah we enjoy getting to talk to people yes who are heavily involved in this stuff and have created a lot of people's uh, you know, favorite moments in TV and movies, animation. So it's it's been an honor to talk with you today, man. Um, uh, likewise, and, likewise. Yeah, people likewise. should definitely check out. Stay tuned. Yes. Drops on CBC Gem Friday, December. Sorry, is it December second? Yeah, December second. Yeah. Friday, December second. In Dates one are week. not your friend. Are... <laughs> you know what? It's that time of year. I feel like this is as soon as you eat that piece of Halloween candy, it's over. Like. I call I call October, November, December the super month, and it's yeah. just like <laughs> it's constant true. eating, constant like I'm 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 done. I just want to play video games and watch movies for the rest of the year. I don't want to work. Pretty much. Pretty I, much. I mean, I'm 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 out here having a great time back in Canada. Next week, there's going to be a ton of, uh, you know, things that we're going to do to promote the show. And uh, again, this is one of the stops on my on my route, and I'm I'm thrilled that I got to speak with you both. And uh, you know, I'm uh, just uh, absolutely tickled gray that you would have me on your podcast, Doc. Thanks. Well, thank you so yeah. much, man. Have yourself a great day. Yep. Yeah, the, 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 uh, that's all, folks. <laughs>